Welcome to Parenting Great Kids. I'm your host, Dr. Meg Meeker, and today we have an amazing, remarkable guest with us, Dr. Chap Clark. He's a renowned expert in youth, family, and culture. Dr. Clark is the executive director of the Institute for Ministry Leadership and Parenting, a professor at Fuller Seminary for over two decades, and he's the author of numerous influential books. I am thrilled to have him here today with me on PGK Podcast so that we can delve into the world of parenting, maybe in grandparenting. I know he has grandkids too, and the evolving dynamics of faith and family. Dr. Clark, thanks for joining me today. Thank you for having me, and I'm glad you read that well from what my mom wrote 20 years ago. So that's so great. Oh, okay, man. first things first. Um, how many grandkids do you have? I had five, four girls and a boy, and uh, seven down to two. Wow. The joy of our lives by far. You know, isn't it the truth? It, you know, being a grandparent <laughs> makes you realize that, she was. wouldn't it be nice if we could go back and redo it all again? But we couldn't. I mean, obviously yeah. we can't, but... So I, I think kind of making all those parenting mistakes is kind of part of it. And hopefully it doesn't turn us into really, really bossy grandparents. Well, but anyway. we kind of, yeah, it depends on how we how we did during those years. You know, yeah. we got to do our work with our adult kids, too, to remember. Absolutely. As they grow, they got a lot to teach us. So here we go, yeah. Meg. Let's have some here fun. Here we go. So I'm going to pick your brain for the next 30 minutes, and I'm thrilled. You know, you've dedicated your career to understanding complexities of adolescence and family dynamics. Talk to us, if you would, about how the world of teenagers has changed since your earlier research in HURT um, in 2004 and HURT 2.0, which was 2011, and how teenagers are coping today, what coping skills have they needed to have because lives, their lives have changed so much? The erosion of what we call social capital or community, as you well know, has been on a slide for decades. And there's a lot of people that have written about that and studied that. Why are we no longer as cohesive as we once were? And uh, what has that done to kids as they grow up? Because they need non-parental adults in their lives almost as much as they need healthy parents in their lives. So this, this uh, slide away from integrated community where kids know that they have a bunch of adult fans in their corner uh, has led to an increasing alienation from the community that they strive that they they long for and strive for for the sense of self because it takes community for you to determine who you are and a sense of of purpose and meaning because you can't have purpose and meaning unless you have other people that affirm what's inside of you that's coming out. So that has eroded over the last 20 plus years to the point that coping is much more external now than it has ever been. It's not. What do, what do you what do you mean by that? Coping um, is external. Well, especially the rise of social media and the internet and uh, a lot of people are blaming social media, but that's way too simplistic. What we've created in our world, that's both true of adults and kids, is that we are all forced to, at a very rapid pace, create different selves for different settings, for different people. Now, we knew 20 years ago that teenagers would build their own world underneath the surface, but they would still have these intimate relationships with one another. Those have eroded as well. So kids grow up trying to figure out who am I, identity, uh, what kind of purpose do I have? Why do I matter? And belonging, who, who cares? Those three things. It's, it's so difficult to do that when I've got an English teacher that has a different agenda than a math teacher, than a coach, than my piano teacher, than my grandma, than my youth group leader, whatever. In other words, the multiple expectations heightened by social media has created these external avatars that kids have to live out of, which robs them of the internal process that all people have have gone through because of community surrounding them. Mm -hmm. There's a lot more to it, obviously, but that's kind of my story. I love it. I love it. They're they're living out these avatars. That's a that's a beautiful picture because you're absolutely right. How did we get here? Uh well the long answer goes back to post-World War II and you go through all that stuff. But yeah. the short answer is 
people that create the changes that have occurred at an increasingly rapid pace in culture uh, do not really care what it does to anybody. Mm-hmm. Bottom line, They're, it, it's consumerist. It is, it's trying to make their mark, their buck, whatever. And so the the fallout has gone gone on human development and families, and also parents and adults. You, you know, probably more than most, that the highest rates of suicide are teenagers and middle aged men. Yeah, you, you wouldn't really think that those demographics would fit together. Match no, exactly. Understand. So it's it's this angst inside because nobody seems to care. Every relationship's transactional, and who's there for me? But when you're growing up as a child or a teenager or a young adult, and you feel like I'm on my own, I got to make this happen. How is that? That's just kind of increasingly rolled over them with with the way our culture's changed, especially the last ten years. Mm-hmm. Well, what I'm hearing you say is that. Teenagers are struggling because they feel pulled away from, disconnected from important adults in their lives, not just mom or dad, but or grandma or grandpa, but, um, you know, a teacher or a coach or um, the friends of a parent or an aunt or an uncle. And they're sort of floating on their own and they're looking outside of that um ecosystem, that healthier ecosystem for answers, and they're not finding them, and they're getting pulled in a different direction, and it makes complete sense. So they're, they're not even getting their basic existential questions answered. Why am I alive? Because if I don't know why I'm alive and who loves me and why they love me, why should I be here? Well, you add to that, do I bring what do I bring to the table? Because exactly. nobody's really everybody has an agenda for me, but almost nobody has my growth interests in mind. Yeah. And nobody needs me to be part of anything. And I think that that's why I I I really like family chores for kids. And parents say, Oh no, my kids have stuff to I tell you why kids need to know they belong to a unit. And that's the sort of the most basic expression of that is that I belong here even if it's just to feed the dog. And obviously I belong here for more, but it's that sense that that somebody wants me for something. And of course you, you expand on that. But I think that sometimes we parents have played into that sense of, you know, you're really an autonomous person and my job is to help you sort of figure out who you are apart from all of us. And it doesn't work. Um, in 20, I love to jump go on ahead. That. Well, I, you, go ahead, go ahead. I think this is a really important point, what you just brought up chores. Yes. Feed the dog, clean the dishes, whatever. Uh, but if you actually dig into that, it's not the work or the duty that matters. It is the sense of self brought to that chore. And why does it matter to the system? Yeah. Why do I matter to the system? And does and here's the biggest thing that I'm pushing really hard, especially with this Institute of Ministry leadership. We're, we're trying to get churches, Catholic, Protestant, anybody that'll care about young adults to say, give young adults voice, not just duties. Yes. So, so in other words, helping kids to determine how they contribute both with their heart and mind as mm-hmm. well as their hands is really important when we add chores to their table. So I just thought that was a, an important thing to come No, I, I think you're absolutely right because as a pediatrician, I, I've heard thousands of kids over the years and their complaints, quote unquote, if you will, it are all kind of the same. I don't know if if anybody sees me or wants me or needs me. Where do I fit? You know, who cares? And these are often kids from great families. Um, right. and, and it, you know, and, it, and it's hard for parents to sort of grapple with this a little bit. But I think it's really important that we help our kids understand that they they are an integral part of the family system. You know, one of the issues I think that plagues a lot of younger parents with kids now who are having marital problems and issues and so forth, and I, I know the world is really hard. I'm not here to point fingers at anybody or do the blame game. But very often in sort of the settling out of marital disputes and things like this, 
the kids are a, a, the the kids are kids are approached by parents as so, you know they're going to be fine. They're really going to be fine. Kids are so resilient. No, they're not. Ooh, and and yeah. and kids <laughs> need to be factored into the equation because you know it really isn't just about you know, the parents and parents need to realize when they factor in their kids needs into the equation, they end up at a happier spot, the parents, you know, so, so you really kind of can't treat the child like an appendage in the family. It had the, the kid has to be sort of an integral part of that. I want to talk about sticky faith. If you're okay, moving on. Okay. I was, well, I was actually thinking of the work Karen Powell and I've been doing for years uh, sticky faith and other a whole lot of other stuff. Uh, so yay, go. What do you want to ask? About? <laughs> okay, talk to us about sticky faith. I love I love the uh, the term, the title, and you know you give a lot of insights for parents on nurturing their child's faith. Um, what are some of the most significant findings or advice that you have seen stand the test of time? Because for parents who have a strong Christian faith, Jewish faith, whatever. Their heart is to transfer that faith to their children because this is what gives them a purpose for life, the parents. I'm one of those parents. And you desperately want your kids to grab hold of the love that you have for Christ God. So what are, the, what are some of the most significant things that you have found that, that really work? I do have to give a shout out to Kara Powell and the Fuller Youth Institute, who's not only a very, very close friend, but she is a brilliant human. And uh, we've worked together on a lot of this stuff for a long time. So first is the faith that we want to pass on cannot be forcing our kids to have our faith. That can't happen. First of all, that's inauthentic and it was not sustainable for them anyway. Uh, the faith of your of your tradition, whatever that tradition is, has to become something that they own, that they wrestle with, that they step into. And our, so our job is to create the environment where they have the best shot to take a careful look at the faith of our family or our tradition. In other words, um, I can't force my kid to believe exactly what I do, nor is that even necessarily good because every one of us has some holes in our own faith system, convictions, whatever. Uh, That's the first thing. Secondly, is the modeling that comes out of this environment. How sincere is the faith of parents? And to to your listeners here, no offense, you all, but I just got to say that that is the most significant reason why so many kids are backing away from faith as they get older. The last, both millennials and especially Gen Z, is that they don't see authentic commitment to the core faith or the faith values. They see rhetoric that's not matched up by, with action. Mm. So that is that just destroys everything. It doesn't matter how many devotionals you can have or what kind of traditions you carry on. So you, right. they see the rules, and they see what they need to do for God, and they see, sort of see, well, I think God is like this because my parents have told me that, but they don't but they don't know why it matters and they don't know the why behind the should do you think well yes but deeper than that it's much more about the in, uh, incongruity of the rhetoric with the actual behavior and statements so in explain words, that explain okay. that tell, tell me what that looks like in i a go to church and i hear a priest or a pastor or a rabbi say um uh love your neighbor as yourself. Well, who is my neighbor? And then you go through that Luke 10 passage. And they get in the car, and then they hear hear their parents start railing on somebody who is different than them or believes differently than they do or something that's going on in the news. And And they grow up with this sense that one of these two is lying to me. Is it the church, an institution, or is it my parents, or is it both? What do I what do I do with this these conflicts that are constantly around me? The polarization does not only affect us relationally in our communities, it deeply affects developmental trajectory. Oh yeah. Especially faith trajectory. And and if parents go to a kid um where we learn to ask more questions 
and invite our kids to give their perspectives without condemnation, create that that sense of space therapists talk that a whole call about, call that a holding space, so do spiritual directors. Have a holding space where there's no condemnation or judgment over statements as long as we can get to the place of allowing our kids to explore life and thought and faith. And if, if you do that and you truly believe in the God that you worship and then you allow yourself to be humble and continue to grow, that will have the greatest influence on your kids' spiritual life. But you know, what you just said doesn't fit in the parenting paradigm of your classic um, well-educated, loving parent who wants the best for their kids. Because what that looks like in parenting, what I've seen, and I'm and I'm I'm putting myself out there too, because I think I did a a lot of what you're talking about with with our kids. Um, is that in order to help my child be successful and happy in life, I need to make sure that they eat the right foods, they go to the right school, that they're <laughs> speaking on time, you know, that they're not late in their speech, and if they have dyslexia, they get their tutoring in preschool, um, that they go to the right high school, that they have the right friends. In other words, there's a path. And our job as parents is to get them on it. And so we teach them, we show them, we make it happen. But you can't do that with faith because you can't, you you can lead your kids and you can help them to to go to church, but that very enthusiastic, intense parent who loves the Lord wants that kid to believe. But, (laughs) But that means surrendering that and sort of taking the nurturing of that faith out of your parenting lane, that paradigm, and saying, okay, maybe I need God's direction here. Um, it's very uncomfortable. Does that make sense? Yeah, you said a lot. This is fun. I wish we had coffee. Isn't this fun? I know, yeah, yeah. You know, or a Presbyterian beverage, just to sit down and really go after these concepts. I I so appreciate what you're saying. Mm -hmm. That said, um, there were a couple of points. You you equated, I don't know if you meant to, but in the the line when you first started that, uh, you equated uh, successful in life and happy in life in the same sentence. Yep. And what that... What that is, is a cultural value that, and as a practical, I was what's called a practical theologian. I know it's an oxymoron, but okay, that was my (laughs) field ultimately. And what that means is, is that faith actually matters in how we live our lives. Uh, That is not a theological truism. It's just not. That, That success in life and going to the right college and getting the right sports and wearing the right clothes, those those are not really equated with the full thriving life that God offers us. Right. And I love how you put it. We want our kids to go down a path. It's a predetermined path. It's that Proverbs passage. Raise up a child in the way they should go, and when they're older, they will not veer from it. Well, right, or, or, or raise them up the way that you go and then push them down the path. Well, and what's interesting is, The emphasis in the Hebrew is the way they should go, not the way I want them to go. In other words, it is their path, not ours, that our job is to help our kid navigate that. And that's one of the most important principles in healthy human development and thriving. We wrote about this in Sticky Faith. This came out of my research in Herd, actually, that you brought up earlier where every kid needs, and there's a lot more to this, but needs at least five non-parental adults who are in their corner to surround them, to help them to explore life in a way that offers their ability to speak into it and wrestle, but there's this safety net, this boundary system around them that's supportive and not controlling, but also doesn't let them go off the edge. Mm Mm-hmm. And as we do that, then they will create the centered self that can follow God and create those new pathways in a changing culture. That's way more important than predetermining our kids' future because we want them to get the right tutor in seventh grade so they can get the scholarship, which I hate to say it, folks, very few of your kids are going to be pro athletes. And if they do, look at how those lives turned out. 
You know, the reason I'm sort of using this lingo is because that's what parents are taught. Your right. job is to make sure that your child is successful, whatever that means, and happy. And that taps into a parent's heart because it makes sense. And that is reiterated over and over and over. And the idea that your job as a parent is to raise a child who will be different from you and take a different path, that hits a nerve. Because that means we may need to accept something very different than what we're comfortable with. And you're absolutely right. And people, and, and what I've seen is a lot of parents will sort of nod when I say, look, you know, please don't split your family up on weekends and everybody go to a different part of the country because your kid's such a talented hockey player. Guess what? He's not going to play in the NHL. And then you're gonna, he's going to go to college. You're going to be ripping mad at him because he can't study. <laughs> so you can you know, so, but, but. So what we're talking about, what you're telling parents and advising parents, which is extremely wise, is to take your kids and parent in, in a way that is sort of opposite of what they're being told. I mean, parents believe because there's so much information coming at them, some of it's good, a lot of it's bad, that they need to check off all of these things. They need to get the right car seat. They need to make sure the kids eat kale. <laughs> I don't know when kale came around, but kale didn't come around. You know what? I don't know. Kale, what, I think, yeah. Kale is what food eats. Food eats kale, <laughs> food. not people. <laughs> yeah. So go ahead. Keep you going. know, anyway, isn't it the funniest thing? But you know what I mean? Parents look at their, their friends and they want to make sure that their kids are keeping up with their kids. And none of this has to do with what you're talking about today, which really is the way you raise a healthy, grounded, uh, young adult who can deal with life's ups and downs. It's very interesting you're talking about friends. I don't, because I want to hear about you, but a very interesting story. <laughs> A couple of years ago, I was driving our son, who's our youngest, back to college. And he was probably a sophomore in college. And so he said, what are you doing tonight, Mom? And I said, well, I'm going to talk to some parents. He said, well, what are you going to talk about? And I said, well, what do you think I should talk to them about? He goes, that is so easy. And I said, really, what is it? He said, tell them two things. One, stop acting like teenagers. And two, make sure they have good friends. And my mouth dropped open. That's and I said, awesome. Oh, it is. And I said, what do you mean? And he said, you know what really helped me, mom, growing up? He said, you know, you and dad are a little different. And you sort of had us go a different route. You wouldn't let us have video games, da, da, da. And he said, but what made it all work for me is that I looked at your friends and saw that they were doing the same thing with their kids. And I knew that what they were doing and you were doing was right. Sure. First of all, not only profound of your son, which is fantastic, by the way. Obviously, that points to a lot of things you guys did really well. And grace of God um, bumped into it. Uh, you're professional, of course, but still when it's your own kids. And the mm -hmm. second thing is that you're your ability to be able to ask him that question and your relationship that allowed for him to feel free to say what he said to you mm -hmm. is exactly what I'm talking about. Creating the environment where your kid can actually reflect back to you. Um, that, I, that story is beautiful on so many different levels. And lastly, it's, it's pushing against the cultural um, erosion of social capital and community because you guys have created that sense of community that your kids were swept up into the five to one. All of that came together in that story, mm. which is oh, any parent out there that's kind of like, oh, I don't know about that guy. Well, all they didn't even know if I'm attractive because this is just audio. <laughs> you probably do usually <laughs> videos, but not, you don't yeah, do video with me, yeah. you do audio. Yeah. And I'm saying to all of you out there, don't be intimidated, but realize, don't worry so much. Mm -hmm. have some, have some fun create some friendships create an environment where your kids go life is awesome we don't know exactly if we're doing it perfect but we need to calm down and love one another and go after it 
Listen, I, this is a great thing. You are not my age. Clearly, you are decades younger than me. <laughs> We're both grandparents here. Yeah. All right. Yeah, there you go. Okay. But as I look back, 42, 38, 35 year old kids, five grandkids, all three of her kids do have their own faith system. Now, I'm, that's not guaranteed. I'm not saying that. But they all have very different journeys, their own pain, their own hurt, their own struggles. But w- what happened because of my wife? She's a therapist and she's an equine therapist and a spiritual director. Henry mm. Nowen had a massive impact <sighs> on both of us. Oh, yeah. Henry was our mentor. Did so, you know him? Yeah. <gasps> Oh. Whole another podcast, but I love whole to another. Tell you. He's one of my. He is one of my heroes. Oh, heroes and I of got the stories state. to tell yes. you if you ever want to do that. But, but Meg, here's the deal: is D had this innate ability to say to our kids all along, going, "You've got gifts, you got talent, you got power. Let's figure out how to use it, but let's let's go after it. Let's go." And I'm kind of the conservative inside the box. Here's the path, and D's more the wild, free, horsewoman, therapist, spiritual director, now and I. And you know what's cool is all four of them have been working on me for for all these years, DNI and I, 43 years of marriage, trying to help me to calm down mm. and go, this journey called life is magnificent, but we complicated so much by trying to fit all of our stuff in this little narrow, narrow hole instead of letting the Lord free us and mm-hmm. letting our kids teach us. Anyway, sorry, I went on a rant. But. No, I think you're right. I think you're absolutely right because, oh, unfortunately, we don't have tons of time left. So, but I, but I, I want and it's fun though. It's so fun. <laughs> We've got to do Henry now. Honestly, he's my favorite author of all time. Right. And Me the too. fact that you knew him, he, yeah. For people who don't know him, he's this incredible priest who really knew how to love people well, and um, he he's unfortunately passed. But we're talking to parents out in our audience who very conscientious parents, very good parents, and they want to do the best thing for their kids because they know my job as a parent is to help tap into my child's greatest gifts and to help them release those gifts and and move forward in life. But what you're talking about here is a very difficult thing to do, and it's more complicated than we think, and yet it's more easy than we think, which is to create an environment where our kids have the ability to question their faith, to think about their faith, to not feel intimidated to question their faith in that way. So parents need to create that environment. Parents also need to, what I'm hearing you say, make sure that you have in place in your child's life other significant adults, which who I assume are very much like you, because you know you, you as a parent. Well, that you uh, trust are going to yeah 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 care yeah. care for your kids in a healthy way. Yeah yeah. So we've so can you give us one or two specific things that parents can do? very tangible, to create an, an environment like that. And then two, how does a parent go about finding those adults and weaving them into their kids' lives? The, fir- the first thing is um, I, I, sticky faith, the biggest impact on kids' faith is the sincerity. I've said this before, but I want to reiterate it the authentic nature of faith, where faith, not as a set of rules or, or, or belief systems, but faith that says God is alive and active, and I can trust that God is active in my kid and in my family and in my own broken heart, because all of us have to come to grips, if we're going to be authentic in our faith, that we are an adequate we are lonely, we are isolated, and we desperately need the depth of what God offers us um, in, in God's presence. Um, that's the Holy Spirit constantly working. And, and that will spill over into our kids if they see that. Not wacky. I'm not saying you, you get obsessive or controlling, but it's a humble faith where God is real and active. And you know what? Praying 15 minutes for each of your kids every day, Heck of a discipline. Mm-hmm. Where and asking the Lord to let you get your agenda out of the way and that God's agenda is brought into the mix with tenderness and mercy. 
read the Gospels and the Sermon on the Mount way more often than you read most other stuff. That's yeah. the first thing. Second thing is, I'm not saying just question faith. I'm saying have a sense of voice to explore the internal incongruities of life that within boundaries. I'm respect. Teach your kids how to be respectful. I know it's very difficult because there are almost zero models out there. But teach your kids how to be respectful and still explore differences of opinion mm-hmm. when they're young. What do you think when you're seven years old as a, there's a conflict at school? Or, okay, does those two things. Um, he had a second question that was just so brilliant that I just let it slip. My parents, mind of... how, how do parents, <laughs> how do parents, no, I was, I was going there too. How do parents find um, oh, good. The other good adults that they can weave into their child's um, ecosystem? Yeah. Let me quote Jesus. Uh, who is good? No one's good, but God alone. Okay. Let me just, so when you say good, it, you get, People in your lives. This is what your son said to you. I just love that. I'm going to hold on to that for a while. <laughs> uh, because you need to have people in your life that is, that's helping you to thrive as a follower of Christ, of, of the faith that God has given you, and as a human being that will love you and care for you. In other words, most churches try to program this with something like a small group or you get in, into an affinity group like missions or serving the homeless or whatever. That There's ways for all of us to connect with other people that have similar faith systems. Um, the best way to do this is to create some kind of structure where you have adults in your life that's regular, whether it's small group or affinity groups or whatever, neighbors, Soccer parents, doesn't matter, really, as long as you have the same stuff. And in so doing, you make an implicit, sometimes explicit agreement that you will all care for each other's kids almost as deeply as you care for your own. Mm -hmm. Now, I didn't say you, you have the permission to yell at them when they run in the street. That's how most people think about it. No, you have the permission to sit down and ask them a question. How are you doing? I think you're great. Let me reflect back on you that I saw how you treated your sibling yesterday, and I was so impressed that you were kind, you listened to your little sister, and that was so fun to watch. What if we had, every family had three or four other families where they all were helping each other to care for their kids, just Mm -hmm. like you guys did? You do that, it's not that hard to find friends if you just have a little humility and then love your kids. And lo- and 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 bring them over and have your friends over for oh, dinner yeah, yeah, yeah. and and you know and just talk with them and and inc- and include your kids in the conversation. Yes, absolutely. You know, and let them of, disagree. Yeah, Great. One of my one of my pet peeves is, and don't take it personally, people who are listening, is when um, parents have kids over and other families and the adults sit at one table and the kids are at another. No, I never had that growing up. I always was sitting with, you know, the adults. And I loved that because I could hear their conversation. And, and that I probably lo- led you to the place where you are now in your own marriage, in your parenting, in your career, in your work, the stability and health that you offer. I bet a lot of that you can point right back to the way you were treated as a kid. Now, I want to say one more thing. Pet peeves. Let's go to pet peeves. When men and women separate when you gather together, that's insane. God has given us together to be community. If we're not healthy enough to have relationships with one another across genders and age, then we got a lot more work to do and not worry about our kids, worry about us first. Right. So so don't have the women go into one room, the guys go in another, everybody has prescribed roles. Let's walk together, serve each other and invite kids in the process. Then you got something. Right. Healthy kids. I just love it. and you know, it's not that hard. You you and I aren't talking rocket science, but what we're doing is we're we're sort of trying to dig into parents' hearts and say, okay, here's where things are a little bit scrambled. So let's kind of unscramble a little bit and just work on this and work on a little bit of that. And it feels intimidating, but just do it. It's it's really not it's really not that bad. Um, Chap, this has been so fun. We Me need too. to do it again. We need to do it again because I've just learned so much um, 
from our conversation today, and I hope that our parents have learned a lot. I I I'm, I trust that they that they will because um, this has just been you've just been a, a remarkable guest and brought a lot of insights. If people want to um, connect with you, uh, find out about your work or um, anything else about what you're doing, how can they find you? It's real easy. Chapclark.com. C h a p Clark.com. And uh, it's a it's a very cheesy week podcast. So for your older guests, they will go, "Yay, something I can read." Everybody else is gonna go, "Ah, get it fixed." <laughs> it is who I am. But there you go. That's you know how what? to get hold of me. You and I are not cool. <laughs> and I never pretend. Hey, I could not be. Well, a youth- I'm not yeah. going that far. I got my guitars on the wall. That you I do. Used to play. I see, I see four guitars in the background. <laughs> so I'm pretty impressed. This has been so much fun. Please come back. Uh, my guest has been Chap. Clark, there's so much I wanted to ask you about we didn't get to, so we're just going to have to do it again. Hey, Meg, great, great to meet you, and I love what you're doing. So thank all you. All the best to you. Thanks. Take care. Bye.